So our speaker tonight is Alexander Horf. He's a mission systems engineer from Airbus Defense and Space. So I'll hand it over to Alexander Horf. Great, thanks very much. Um, yeah, hey everyone, good to see you. Uh, so I'm Alexander Horf, so I'm, uh, as Scott said, mission systems engineer at Portsmouth. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you today about space junk, so space debris, um, and whether we're actually still gonna be able to use space in the future. Um, I don't know if probably most of you are the aerospace engineers, right? So you, you kind of understand the space industry, but people online might not know that <clears throat> you use uh, assets in space every day. Uh, it's not just your satellite navigation. Um, if you make a bank transfer or anything, um, you're using satellites. So we obviously still need to be able to use that uh, in the future. Uh, I thought it might be helpful to give you like a little overview of how I came into my job at the moment. Um, so I did a master's in aerospace engineering at the University of Surrey. Um, I did a placement year. Um, so I did like a sandwich course at Lockheed Martin. Um, that was kind of interesting. I was meant to be working on helicopters and they put me on ships. So it wasn't very inspiring as an aerospace engineer, um, but it was still you know, good lessons learned. Uh, I then joined the Surrey Space Centre as well. Um, so that was like a, a small section of the University of Surrey that was able to build and launch satellites. Uh, got involved in this project called Remove Debris, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, but basically, since joining Airbus on the graduate program uh, like five years ago, I've been chucked into a load of stuff. So uh, it's a really good company to work for, highly recommend it. Um, and I highly recommend a grad scheme as well, because you get to work on lots of different projects um, and yeah, get loads of experience. So now on to the, um, the actual lecture itself. And I do apologize for starting off with a graph. Um, but this kind of helps to show you how much junk there is in space. Um, when we say junk, um, it's kind of like the junk you have on Earth. Uh, it's just stuff that isn't usable. OK, so we're not talking like micrometeorites or, or bits coming from um, other solar systems. We're, we're talking about satellites or rockets that we've just discarded. We don't need any more um, and they're just floating around. Um, and there's been a couple of events that have created loads more junk and random objects. Um, you can see a big spike here, uh, and there was a nation that decided to shoot a satellite down with a missile, because they thought that would be a great way to demonstrate how we can get rid of satellites. Um, yeah, we created like 3,000 bits of junk from that. Um, and another one, you can kind of see uh, the little line in 2009, two satellites smashed into each other at 90 degrees at like 17 kilometers a second, um, and in turn created thousands of bits of junk. Um, and that's really what we're worried about. We can stop people sending missiles up into space, um, but we can't really stop uh, satellites smashing into each other if we can't control them. Uh, so just to give you like a little infographic about what's up there, it's actually loads of this unidentified objects, just bits of junk, astronauts, gloves, toolkits, stuff that we can't really control. Um, and it's even made it into uh, like mainland news, which you know is actually important, um, where we see satellites smashing into each other or having to dodge each other. Um, one of these Chinese satellites got hit by a piece of uh, a rocket from Russia um, that was a complete accident. But, you know, some of these things people can get really touchy over, let's say. Um, so we don't want to cause international havoc by um, satellites smashing into each other and creating more like war. Um, but we also have the fun benefit of um, mega constellations. So Starlink satellites uh, from SpaceX. Um, yeah, this is a tweet from Hugh Lewis, uh, who's a lecturer here, um, just showing the sheer number of conjunctions they're called. So basically alerts that your satellite's gonna smash into something. Um, and they're getting 20 a day, okay? So these things, you know, you should be getting them, I don't know, every other month or so. Uh, and they're having to deal with this every single day, multiple risks that satellites are gonna smash into each other. Um, and this is a real worry um, because we don't want, you know, well, actually this is an old slide, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's not a new problem. Uh, they've been tracking satellites since we started sending them up in the 50s and 60s. Um, but we're worried about this thing called the Kessler syndrome. Um, so that's when you have a, a chain reaction where uh, something smashes into one satellite uh, and the debris smashes into another satellite, which smashes into another one. Um, if any of you have seen gravity, um, it's kind of like that. Please don't try to learn any astrodynamics from gravity. It's terrible. Um, but it, it's a good film that shows you that junk can be bad. Um, we, we don't want Earth to look like this, but that's currently what Earth looks like um, with all the objects above one millimeter. Uh, I think it is from uh, the European Space Agency, ESA. Um, 
you can kind of see the, the geostationary belt around the outside uh, and low Earth orbit is this really congested space where everything is crossing over each other. Um, and that's where we send a lot of our satellites, actually, because they're nice and low. Um, it's good for Earth observation satellites uh, and the new kind of satellite constellations for communications. So there are ways that we can deal with debris. You know, my, the title of the uh, presentation is, are we going to be able to launch satellites in the future? Um, there are things that you can do to avoid debris. Uh, one of them is space traffic management. And we actually have loads of um, observation stations around the Earth. Um, there's one in America called Space Fence, like radars and telescopes are looking at all these objects to make sure um, that they're not going to hit each other. And they do these massive computations to try to predict uh, whether stuff's going to collide. Um, and they're also, unfortunately, a lot of defense agencies making sure that people who put satellites up uh, are doing what they should be doing. Um, but that's a whole other story and topic. Um, the other thing they can do is uh, ensure mission reliability. So believe it or not, the satellite was meant to do that. Uh, that's the ATV, the autonomous transfer vehicle that we build in Airbus, uh, and that's doing a controlled burn. So what you want to do is to have your satellite to um, survive and not blow up whilst you're using it, but also uh, have the confidence at the end of the mission to say, OK, we're going to bring it out of orbit. We're not going to create more junk. Uh, orbit design is an interesting one as well. If you have stuff really high up, um, it can stay in orbit for a long time. Uh, whereas if you put it very low down, it can have the drag to pull it out of orbit. Uh, and uh, you know, we don't want you to chuck out any expendable parts. So on here, you can see uh, the small crack uh, that Tim Peake um, took a picture on the International Space Station, uh, which was, I think it was like a micrometer piece of uh, paint that smashed into the window and cracked one of the panes of glass on the International Space Station. Um, thankfully, they've got like four panes, um, so they were able to protect against this. Um, but you know, we talk about satellites, but we've also got astronauts in space 24 seven. Um, and the International Space Station is always having to move out of the way to make sure that it doesn't smash into a satellite. So um, if we really want to look at space um, as a, a tourism industry, um, we need to make sure that people can survive in space and you don't just get hit by a, uh, a satellite every time you go up. So the projects that I have been working on uh, are active debris removal projects. And this is essentially your backup plan. Um, if something goes wrong, if your satellite fails, um, if you say launched it back in the 50s and you didn't realize that space debris was a problem and it's still floating up there, uh, like the Prospero satellite that we sent up in, was it the 80s or so? Um, you know, we're developing systems called active debris removal where we're gonna go up, grab your satellite, drag it out of orbit, um, just like a, a bin man really, going up and picking up the rubbish. Um, very expensive bit of that. Uh, we're going to go on. So what what's actually being done? You know, uh, space debris is it's not just a problem for Airbus. Um, it's a worldwide problem. Everyone's using space. Um, I'm focusing on the European projects here, um, but the European Space Agency had a project called ED Orbit. Um, has a nice big satellite called MVSAT um, that we built that is eight tons the size of a double decker bus. Um, it was designed for five years. It worked great for five years. So we thought we use it for another five years and it survived for like another three or four years and then died. And then everyone was like, oh, what do we do about this great big double decker bus floating around in space? So uh, ESA, you know, commissioned us for this project um, to see if we could deorbit it. That was great. That was then scrapped in 2018 because it was a lot of money, uh, hundreds of millions of euros to go up and take down one piece of debris. Uh, we run this other project uh, that I worked on called Remove Debris, uh, which was co-funded by the Euro European Commission. And this was like a technology demonstrator. So rather than doing what ESA were doing, which was like, let's go grab the biggest piece of junk we can find. We were like, OK, let's take some baby steps and we'll do some small technology demonstrators. Um, and that's what I'll talk about after this. Um, but that was successful in 2019. Uh, there were some other uh, commercial uh, companies such as Astroscale, uh, various others that are sending up satellites to demonstrate the same thing that we did for remove debris, but you know the next step on. Um, so they've launched at the moment. Um, they published in August that they did the first little capture where they released something and grabbed onto it again. Um, and we're just waiting to hear you know the next steps of that project of whether they can actually um, perform rendezvous where they separate the two objects and go and capture them again. Uh, and then the European Space Agency realized they did want to capture some debris. Um, so they're running a project called Adrios, 
Um, everyone loves an acronym in the industry. So it is, um, I believe it's ADR, Active Debris Removal and In-Orbit Servicing, um, or In-Orbit Services. Um, but yeah, so they're running that, and the UK Space Agency are doing the same thing. So we are um, participating in some studies with them, and some other companies are doing their own studies um, to look at how do we how do we make a system to go and grab a satellite. So remove debris. Um, we had four kind of key technologies on this. Uh, one of them was the visual based navigation at the top left, you can see, um, and that was testing um, how you would track uh, an object in space that we can't communicate with. Uh, we had the harpoon target assembly that I worked on, which is where we fired a harpoon at a target to see if we could capture it. We did the same thing with a uh, net. Um, so people joke about um, removed debris being inspired by sailors. We've got a net, we've got a harpoon, and we put a sail on the back as well. Um, and we're using it just as sailors would um, to kind of drag yourself out of orbit. Uh, so it was launched from the International Space Station. I believe that's Ricky Arnold um, putting it into the, uh, the airlock. Um, and it was like a really good way, cheap way to launch the satellite. We sent it up in a Dragon capsule. Um, they then unloaded it with all their other goods, um, like water and food and a 100 kilo satellite, dragged it through the space station. Um, we had to jump through a billion different hoops to try to prove to NASA that having a satellite that can fire a harpoon through <laughs> uh, the International Space Station is a good idea and it's uh, really cheap. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so we managed to get through all those safety nets. Um, the astronauts describe the, the um, satellite as like this amazing piece of kit because they usually get you know a big clunky box that you put on the wall, uh, whereas this was nice and shiny with all the solar rays and radiators. Um, they put it in the airlock, uh, close the hatch, and then the, uh, I think it was the cannon arm, uh, grabbed it from the other side uh, and then released it. Um, so this was good in two ways. It was good because it was a very cheap launch for us and we didn't have lots of money. Uh, the second way was that we released it below the International Space Station so that if anything went wrong, um, if we fired a harpoon and the tether snaps, we weren't going to hit the space station. Uh, that would be really bad. Um, so it was a good, <laughs> good bit of orbit design there. <laughs> um, so the first payload that we actually demonstrated uh, was this net payload uh, developed by Airbus in Germany. And it basically is a net with some weights around the edge that we threw to capture a satellite. Um, so we had this small CubeSat. I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with CubeSats, but basically it's like the size of a loaf of bread, um, and it was our target. So on board, we had some inflatable uh, structures. Um, these were strain rigidized aluminium booms uh, with some sails on the outside, and that was to make it bigger, so it's a more uh, decent target to capture, but also uh, it acted like a drag sail, so it kind of pulled out of orbit. Uh, and they were really lucky because they got to go on the Vomit Comet and do some testing. Um, and it's essentially, oh, there we go. Yeah, so it's a net with some weights on the outside um, and some springs to, to deploy it. And then we have a winch to capture it around. And I've got a nice video because we demonstrated this and it worked perfectly, apart from some things that went wrong uh, that I want to see if you can try to spot. Let's see if this is going. So that's the CubeSat deploying. Uh, and that's the net firing. And you can see there was a piece of string at the end that kind of just went. So uh, you would, in a real mission, hold on to that piece of string, and that allows you to pull your target out of orbit. Um, but for this one, we didn't attach it to anything. Um, and before people say, well, aren't you making debris by chucking stuff at your satellite? Um, that's why we put the drag sails on board, and we also uh, launched it in, I believe it was retrograde, so that it would fall out of orbit quicker. Um, but yeah, it worked. We captured it. Great success. Uh, the target satellite popped. I don't know if you, you guys saw that. Um, we had inflatable structures, which was a great idea, uh, until it popped and it started spinning wildly out of control. Uh, so it started to spin away and to the right of the spacecraft, which was not good. Um, but we still captured it, which showed how robust the capture system was. It just happened a little further away. Um, yeah, it happened at about 12 meters rather than the planned seven meters. Uh, the other thing was that the net didn't fully deploy. So it's good that you do these missions before you send up like a 200 million euro satellite to go do it for the first time. Uh, you can do as much testing as you want on ground, simulations, everything. Until you do it in real life, you don't really know exactly how it's going to be, uh, how it's going to act. So this is a really good demonstration, which worked. Um, and it's one of the systems that we're baselining in the future. Uh, the other payload we demonstrated was the visual based navigation. 
Um, so this had a, a laser receiver and um, a color camera. So two different methods of tracking a satellite. Uh, and we had another target satellite that we released with a camera uh, and a, a GNSS receiver and an inter-satellite link so that we could uh, send the position and pictures back to the mothership when we tested it. Um, and the reason we need visual-based navigation is imagine trying to uh, catch like a, a tennis ball or a football at you with your eyes closed and you just have to guess when you're going to catch. Uh, it doesn't really work and that's kind of how a lot of systems are built nowadays where um, you have to predict exactly what's going to happen and where something's going to be for your robotic arm or um, whatever capture mechanism you use to be able to predict where it's going to be. Um, so we, we developed this navigation system uh, with Airbus and Toulouse as well as CSCM and Inria um, to be able to track an object in real life as if you had eyes. Um, and we've got another video of this one being released. So this one didn't have a drag sail, so it's going to survive a little longer than the others. But you can see the little hole is where the, um, the webcam was. Uh, and on the back, you've got GNSS receivers uh, and the inter-satellite link as well. So this was similar to the other uh, CubeSat, same size, like a loaf of bread. Um, but we just released it, spun it up a little bit, and just watched it float away. So this was uh, another success. Um, we were able to track it in six degrees of freedom when it was close. Um, the inter-satellite link worked. Um, it sounds really easy, but it's quite difficult to have uh, a wireless link in space for loads of reasons. Um, and we got some good results uh, from the tracking of the lasers, the tracking of the camera, the tracking of the GPS. Um, yeah, you can kind of see the, the camera went a little bit doolally. Was that camera? No, it was a GPS went a bit off. So if you can have a GPS on your satellite, also have some other things to definitely tell you where it is um, to make sure you don't shoot the wrong target or the wrong bit. Um, but yeah, overall, it was a good success. Uh, and we got some really top quality pictures back from the CubeSat. Um, they were pretty rubbish, <laughs> the CubeSat pictures. Um, but it was just a demonstrator to show that you could take pictures and you get some sort of data back. Um, I think it was just like a um, off-the-shelf webcam or something that they built, um, put on it. So it was nothing too expensive. Um, but yeah, another really good success for the algorithms that we were testing um, and something that we can implement on a real mission. Uh, and now for the really fun one, which is the one that I worked on, um, which is the harpoon design. Um, so we essentially have a chamber to build up some gas. We shoot a projectile uh, made of titanium. Uh, it's got some springs on the end so that when we impact through a target, we can then pull back on it. Um, and some other bits and bobs um, to make it work. Uh, we had these really cool cold gas generators, which was essentially like a solid rocket motor but instead of making lots of heat and thrust, it made lots of cold nitrogen. Um, and this again was something that NASA were really worried about. They didn't want us to kind of put a pipe bomb on the ISS or anything. Um, but you know, we had loads of different safety mechanisms on the Harpoon. We had like a door in front with another uh, thing on front of that. And then all of the uh, power systems were like triple quadruple redundant so that you couldn't accidentally fire it off. Uh, and this is the video of it working. Um, I'll just play it and I'll, <laughs> I'll let you see what happens. Um, so this is in real time. It works. <laughs> uh, and if you keep on watching, it kind of comes back around for a second visit. Um, so some interesting things happened. Um, we knew that it was going to break off. This was verified through on-ground testing. There you go. So it still captured it. Um, with the harpoon experiment, we we released the target uh, at a set distance. Um, we didn't do any of the like tracking maneuvers uh, or anything. We just wanted to verify that the harpoon worked. Um, and what was nice about it snapping off is that you can actually see the backside of it um, to see how far the harpoon went through. Um, so yeah, so that was a really good success. I've got it in slow-mo as well, so you can kind of see. Um, that's going, yeah. So one of the constraints you have if you use a harpoon to capture a satellite is um, you want to make sure you, you shoot the right bit of the satellite. You don't want to shoot the propellant tanks and it go pop. Uh, you also don't want to shoot the batteries because they'll go bang. Uh, and you don't want to shoot the solar arrays as well because they've got lots of glass. So um, with the harpoon, you need a bit more fine tuning of where you're actually going um, gonna to shoot and capture your target. But um, what the test showed is that it was really accurate, actually. 
um, within 25 millimeters, uh, one and a half meters uh, range. Um, we could hit anywhere in the green circle. If we hit outside that green circle, we would hit uh, some metal on the other side, so it would have hit the target and then bounced off. Not very good. Um, and we predicted it should hit somewhere in the gray region uh, due to on-ground calibration. And it basically hit it right in the center of that. So we were really, really happy um, with the results. Um, and you know, the, the harpoon payload itself weighs just over a kilo, really small, really cheap and lightweight. Um, and it's something that you can use to capture lots and lots of satellites. Um, and you can scale it just like the net to capture big satellites or, or smaller ones. And then the last experiment we, uh, we did was the drag sail. So this was developed by Surrey Space Center. Um, and essentially it is a, a sail made of like the space blanket that you put on yourselves after you've done a race, uh, mylar. Uh, we used some carbon fiber booms, rod shoe booms to be able to pull that sail out. Uh, and then we also had an inflatable boom as well. Um, unfortunately, we don't think this one worked uh, and we, we couldn't verify this with any cameras on board um, because uh, the sail effectively was on the other end of the satellite without any cameras. Um, but zooming in, you can see this is where we fired the net. This is the, uh, the altitude. So as soon as we fired the net, uh, the altitude was going down from the net stack. Visual based navigation as we released the CubeSat, that was went down, but nothing changed when we deployed the sail. Um, so we deduced that it didn't work. Um, the satellite is still in an orbit where it will um, fall out of the sky within five years or so. Um, which is kind of industry standard. Um, but what's nice about this plot is you can see the space station uh, is the, the top line um, and all the maneuvers that it has to make um, to miss satellites. So what NASA do is if they need to move the space station to miss a satellite, they just bump the, old, uh, the altitude up because it's always falling out of the sky. So they just coincide the, the uh, orbit maneuver with a, uh, an orbit raising maneuver. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, there was no cameras, so we couldn't see that it was a success. Um, but Surrey did launch a, a following mission, which was launched before removed debris, but was the upgraded version, um, and that did work. And so did the second satellite as well, I believe. So, um, so it is a system that we can use. Um, and Airbus are also working on a variety of other technologies for active debris removal. Uh, one of the main ones that I worked on is um, the robotic side. So I helped to develop the two arms on the left. Um, so we have big satellite, uh, LAR, a big satellite, big robotic arm LARD on the right and a couple of the smaller ones on the left. Um, and what's really novel, I guess, about these robotic arms is um, they're small, they're lightweight, they're cheap, which means the industry will use them. Um, so in comparison, like the Canada arm on the space station weighs thousands of kilograms, is I think it's like 17 odd meters long, whereas this is uh, two meters long, weighs 10 kilos, I think it's 15 kilos, and probably costs like a thousandth of the price of Canada. Yes, admittedly, it's smaller, um, but you don't need these huge arms for, for active debris removal and in orbit servicing as well. So we, we try to, uh, as Airbus is a satellite manufacturer, we don't necessarily operate the satellites. Um, so we have to tell satellite uh, designers and, and the customers that are buying them what we think they should put on their satellite to make sure that uh, we don't create loads of junk in space. So some of the things we tell them to put on are fiducial markers. So these are like special codes, uh, special pictures that we can use to track a satellite. Uh, this is actually the, the target that they put on the 650 odd OneWeb satellites that are up there or going up there. Uh, we tell them to put on uh, grappling fixtures, retro reflectors, passive tumbling devices. Um, one thing people don't realize is that as soon as your satellite fails in orbit, it likes to spin and it can spin really, really quickly up to like 20 odd degrees per second for some of them. Um, so you need things to be able to, to slow it down passively. Um, and essentially they just need to plan for it. Uh, loads of people don't really think about end of life for satellites. They just focus on the mission. We're going to make lots of money. It's going to work for 10 years and then we'll just throw it away. But um, it's a it's a big issue for us. So we've Prove the technology, I've shown you removed debris, that worked, all these other projects. Why don't we have it now? So two, two of the big uh, challenges for us uh, are space law uh, and the actual business case. So uh, what I didn't realize is that you could actually be a space lawyer well, as a job title, it's pretty cool. Um, they've got a massive issue ahead of them for this whole 
active debris removal business capturing satellites. Um, so I wanted to do a little uh, Q&A with you or, or workshop type thing to understand how you would go about space law. So we have this satellite here, right? Uh, let's say it was built in the UK, uh, the rocket was launched in the UK, and the rocket was made in the UK. Who do you think is responsible for the satellite? The UK. Yeah, this is really easy. You know, space law is easy. Great. Uh, your satellite blew up, and now you have thousands of bits of junk, which you can track. Who's responsible for the junk? The UK. Yeah, could be. Could be someone else. Could be no one. Who knows? There was nothing in your mandate when you built your satellite that if it blew up and made lots of junk that you were responsible for it. But let's say that you could prove that somebody else's junk smashed into your satellite. It was doing its, its thing. It was absolutely perfect, doing its mission. You designed it, um, but that piece of rocket came and smashed into it. Now, who, who do you think is responsible for the debris? And um, this is where it gets really tricky because we don't want to play the blame game. We, we don't want to say, you, your country made loads of junk and then you hit my satellite because you know, it can just be chaos. But it gets really complex when you start looking at what actually happens with satellites. Okay, so imagine the satellite is built in the US. We launch it on a rocket made by Russia and they launch it from Kazakhstan. Who do you think is responsible for the rocket left over? Like international law says it's the, the launching state. So is the launching state Kazakhstan or Russia or is it USA that paid them to do it? Um, it gets really tricky and it doesn't stop when we look at active debris removal because let's say that rocket is uh, is something that we want to take out of orbit because it's, it's a big piece of junk. We would need Russia's permission to go and touch that rocket or even go near it and then take it out of orbit. And let's say we went and tried to grab on it. Just imagine that this satellite is the rocket. At what point does that liability go to each party. Like, if it's a Russian piece of junk and it's a UK satellite that goes and grabs on it, grabs grabs it, is it UK's junk if we grab it? Uh, is it Russia's junk if we grab it? If it, this is really bad terms. Uh, <laughs> at what point does the liability switch to each satellite? And you can you can kind of see where I'm going. But then it also gets really complex if something blows up on either party. Who's responsible for the debris? And what I'm trying to get at is. We can't do a blame game of you're creating junk and therefore you have to pay for it. It's got to be similar to what we're doing with global warming or plastic in the ocean. You have bad actors who are deliberately polluting that and we can get them to stop it. But essentially, it's everyone's responsibility to put money in um, to, to go and grab, a, grab the junk and clean up space. Um, and I've mentioned money a lot. It all comes down to money, okay? <laughs> it's the really sad truth. Uh, we look at the business case for an active debris removal mission. Nobody wants to pay to, to take their satellite out of orbit if it fails. They just want to say, oh, my hands up. It was not my fault. I'm really sorry. I'm going to go launch some more satellites. Um, and yeah, so out of the $3.2 billion that uh, you can make uh, in the in-orbit servicing industry in the next 10 years, 1% is for active debris removal, and everything else is for all the really interesting stuff that they can make money off. And we see this all the time. Every time we try to pitch a project to internal customers or external customers, it's all about show me the money. Like, am I going to make money of this? Am I going to save money of this? Um, so that's why a lot of companies are moving towards in-orbit servicing. Um, it's this generalized term which they put loads of technologies under. It's really quite frustrating. Um, so in-orbit servicing in general means uh, assembly in space or manufacturing in space, uh, repairing, doing AOCS takeover or disposing of satellites. Um, so we've basically taken debris removal, which you can't make any money off, and we've shoved it under uh, the term in-orbit servicing uh, where we can use the same kind of building blocks. Um, but in-orbit servicing is not uh, a new thing. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope, which was sent up in the 90s. Um, I don't know if you know the story, but it broke a lot. 
Um, so they had five different servicing missions to, to try to fix it. Uh, one of the first ones was they sent it up and it wasn't focusing correctly. Um, so they had to go and replace one of the optics with some modified optics um, so they could get the really pretty pictures that you see today. Um, so why can't we just send up astronauts to go and grab satellites and bring them down? Uh, I believe they did that with one of the Intel sat satellites uh, with the space shuttle. Um, but astronauts are very expensive. They need a salary, they need health insurance so they don't get hit by some debris. Um, they're also high risk. Uh, they drop things, they, they do things that you can't program a computer to do. Um, one of my favorite stories is on the space station, they were putting like a, a shield for debris on one of, the, um, one of the modules of the space station and the astronaut let go, in turn making that shield a piece of debris that they then have to dodge in the future. So it's, yeah, astronauts are risky. They're also very slow as well because they need to take breaks and go to sleep. Um, so when we talk about in-orbit servicing, we mean uh, autonomous in-orbit servicing, where we're using satellites and robots to be able to fix each other. Um, Airbus have developed a system for this. Um, so it's something that we advertise to customers uh, where we have the full service concept is based off our OneSat telecoms platform. Um, it's able to capture kind of 20 targets. I say targets there, uh, we designed this for OneWeb, so the targets are like 150 kilos. Uh, we're able to capture 20 at a time before you either remove the servicer or you refuel it to, to do it again. Uh, we can capture loads of targets, it's robotic capture. We use this really novel propulsion system, um, which I can't talk much about, but it's really good and it's really clean as well. Um, so, if we've got all of these concepts, if Airbus have this servicer that we are trying to sell to people, um, surely that means that space is still going to be usable in the future. But it really depends on your future going into the industry as students in the room of what you're going to push for your governments to pay for and to develop, what you might develop yourself as you, you go into the industry. Um, we see loads of uh, graphs like this where people are predicting what's going to happen with the number of objects in space. If we don't do anything, say if we just keep chucking stuff up, um, obviously the number's just going to go higher and higher. Uh, and then we might get to this Kessler syndrome where space is unusable. Um, you might look at this graph and say, Xander, the answer is really easy. You just look at the green line and you just take five objects out a year and then it's problem solved. Um, this doesn't include the new constellations that are being considered. Uh, so SpaceX are sending up, is it like 3,000 Starlink satellites uh, for Gen 1? And then Gen 2 is like 20,000 or something ridiculous. Uh, OneWeb, again, they're, they're putting up 650 satellites for this Gen 1. Gen 2 is going to have, I believe it's thousands more. Um, People are trying to get into space. There's more and more objects coming up into space. The, the assumptions for this was the past eight years. And if you look at how much the industry has changed in the past eight years, and then imagine eight years into the future, what we'll have. We'll have at least three mega constellations of telecom satellites in LEO in eight years, at least. Uh, we might have the Axiom Commercial Space Station where you can go up uh, for tourism in space. Um, we might have a completely new International Space Station um, for science. Uh, it's rapidly changing and it's a big issue that we need to sort out. Um, and what I feel we need is COP22, looking at global warming, but we need it for space, for space debris. Um, it's a global effort. Uh, and I'm not saying that we're not working on this in the UK or as countries across the world. We are working on it, but we need this kind of turning point where we put a line in the sand and we say, this line is where we're going to stop sending junk in space and we're going to start finding people who, who release objects into, into space. Um, so that's hopefully where we're going to get to. Um, one of the ways that Airbus are doing that is uh, we're helping the, um, is the World Space Foundations. Uh, they're basically developing a sustainability rating. Um, so just like when you go into a restaurant uh, and they've got the health standards and you see a two star rating, two out of five, you kind of go to it and you kind of go, I don't want to eat there and you walk away to somewhere else. We're doing the same thing with spacecraft where you can put a, um, like a bronze, silver, gold, platinum type stamp on the side so that you can actively promote 
that you're developing a, a good spacecraft that doesn't harm the environment. So that's that's one way we're we're, uh, we're developing uh, methods to, to clean up space. Um, but essentially, we need more of these projects that we're doing. Uh, we need more buy-in from uh, from governments. So that that is it for me. Uh, I think we've got some time for some questions. Um, but thank you very much, and I think.